Sehr geehrte Ladies and Gentlemen, it's a pleasure for me to welcome you here after a, at least for me, quite relaxing summer break and to welcome you back to our lecture series. This uh, lecture series is organized by uh, the BPB together with the Alexander von Humboldt Institute. We have been organizing this t since 2017. With this lecture series, we would like to, we always invite interesting, exciting and uh, thought-provoking speakers who talk to us about the current, the ongoing and the future changes due to technologies in our society. And together we discuss them. And we also discuss how society develops towards a digital society. The questions in the background are how does power sh um, shift within society? We see a strengthening of participation and of social movements and we also discuss the challenges of uh, control mechanisms and other mechanisms of digital uh, technologies. I wish you an interesting and insightful evening and on that note I would also like to say thank you to all those colleagues who organized this evening tonight. Thank you for uh, having worked so much in this heat here already. Please give a round of applause. And having said that, I would now like to give the floor to our moderator, Tobi Müller. Thank you very much, Sascha Scheyer from the BPB. I'd also like to thank the Humboldt Institute for Internet and Society for uh, giving me the opportunity to be your host tonight. Diejenigen, die Deutsch nicht verstehen, können sich gerne Kopfhörer holen, um die Verdolmetschung zu hören. This is our third such lecture that's taking place with more than 30 degrees outside. We were here in Juni with, uh, in July, and uh, no, with Josef van Dijk in June, and we also had Luis Amor here in July, and now it's still more than 30 degrees, and some men are still attending here in suits and closed leather shoes, and that's one problem that I also hope that digitalization will solve in the future. I already discuss, discussed this with um, Ms. Dijk, who um, uh, complained about the high heels but maybe we can see a change in this in the future. I would now like to talk about our guest briefly and afterwards we will uh, hear his lecture and then we can have some uh, questions after a brief discussion that I will have with him. We also use a hashtag digital societies that you can see up front which allows you to ask questions through Twitter and this also holds true for everyone attending online because we are being streamed. And you will then be able to see uh, the uh, record uh, recording of this session later on online as well. During these lecture series, we sometimes hear negative tones when our guests talk about machine learning, about artificial intelligence, or predictive algorithms, about platforms, and our continuous non-everlasting uh, relationship with them. And we hear a bit more of a positive tone when you talk about leeways from a European perspective, at least at times. And others, such as Louise Amour in July, I quoted her already, gave uh, this a rather positive attitude, this negative and this opaque uh, something. Uh, algorithms need to learn how to calculate with uncertainties in order to not produce such closed and excluding profiles and worldviews. We often talk about instability more than about stability. We discuss the phenom phenomenon of liquidiz liquidization 
um, and we talk more about what is new and not what is old. It's a bit different with Dirk Becker, but he is a system theorist, just like our guest today. He is a so-called happy skepticist, if I may say so. Our guest today has a bit of a different methodological approach than many of the speakers in our lecture series. You already see this in his title of his speech, What Problem Does Digitalization Solve? He will explain the shift uh, in a few minutes, so I do not need to preempt this. However, I would like to say that it's a project that sees a modernity as the basis of digitalization. One could say modernity calls and says we have a problem, and digitalization then picks up the phone and says I'm on it. Today, his uh, already widely adopted book is being uh, published. Uh, the title translates to Patterns Theory of the Digital Society. It's uh, another book in a series of his previous work, but uh, since this is not a book launch, we are all the more proud that he came from Munich to Berlin. He has a book, a, 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 a presentation here, and a language that is not necessarily a matter of course and that differentiates his work from many others. He, already, he also uses the word I at times, which is also another differentiation. Uh, some people might might uh, sweat when hearing this. Even the editorial department of the Spiegel, for instance, might hearing this Anglo-Saxon word. But he is such a rarity that uh, we could call him a public intellectual. He has different kinds of registers, also in his new book, this Patterns one. This is why in 2012 he received the Outstanding Achievements Award in the field of publicity for sociology from the German Sociological Association. And this was the case, although there are always two terms coming up when talking about him, which he sometimes even laughs about himself, namely complexity and perspective difference. So it's not only about simplifying with him. He studied in Münster and Hagen. He studied educational science philosophy and sociology. And fast forward now to 1998, when he became professor of sociology at the Ludwig Matzewilliams University in Munich. Quite uh, significant for him was the system theory uh, of Niklas Luhmann. I was very glad about his introduction into Luhmann's thinking from the university handbooks in 1993, which made my approach to this theory much easier than having than if I had used another one. Um, in addition to the classical sociological focuses, such as published in 2011 in his book Societies of the present, our guest also deals with empirical ethic uh, research, religious sociology, and also other topics such as assisted dying. Since 2012, he is the editor of the cultural journal Kursbuch together with Peter Felixberger, founded in 1965 by Hans Magnus Enzensberger. At kursbuch.online, you can always read what public intellectual actually means, for instance, in one of his columns. This is about public, it's about intellectual, but it's also about a certain lack of fear of, of uh, issues and territories that are not yet as mapped as others in academia. He talks about problems and examples and will do so now as well. A warm welcome. Well, the alternatives so, were already mentioned just so. now. Either this or that. I would uh, advocate both. Und, uh, I'm happy to be here tonight to and to be able to talk to you about um, digitalization. Ja, ich hab mich für eine Theorie der Digitalisierung, I der focused on a theory on digital digitalization and digitality that focuses not so much on what people in this room may know more than I know about, which is the following question. What does digitalization have to do with society in an empirical sense and what, how these two things change society? This is a discourse that happens in social sciences, in the general public, etc. Our society is 
preparing for something that it constantly says would be disruptive, which is in its, in its form very interesting. And society is also trying to adapt to these phenomena and it tries to tackle these disruptions. That interests me as well, but what interests me more is this. What do we talk about when we talk about digitalization and the digital character of things? I need to name these, in, in mention these two terms because digitalization means a process towards more digital life, and I'm more focused more on this digitality, if you will, but I don't want to uh, split hairs here now. So so the term that usually is used here is disturbance, disturbances in the labor market, disturbances with regard to the fact that there's hardly any communication that wouldn't leave a trace that was intended in the communication itself, information overload our concerns that we could get to an end of theory, if you will, uh, corruption of all things scientific, because we can all now handle large amounts of data about the question that the original can no longer be distinguished from the uh, copy or the imitation and maybe the fact that there is no real distinction even anymore. The concentration of data and capital all are also is also happening in a parallel way, and that has an influence on economic potency. This also leads to the question, what does property mean? Non-human decision-making tools are also an important aspect. All these things I focus on in my book as well, but these are all secondary. What I care about is that question, what problem does digitalization solve? And so you can see from the title that I'm not really in chapter one. This is chapter minus one, if you want to put it that way. So you may wonder, what kind of a weird question is that? The question is not what problems does digitalization cause? The question is not how can you tackle digitalization? And it's also not can we control digitalization or does digitalization control us? All these questions are highly interesting, but my question is different. What problem does digitalization solve? So you may wonder now, how can you even come up with such a weird question? You come up with such a weird question if you're a sociologist who does not just have an interest in theories or systems theories, all these terrible things, but if you also conduct empirical social research. And if you do that in a way that social scientists encounter phenomena that they can observe. I don't want to talk about how we observe them. You can spend several evenings on that. But we see that something is going on, and we observe that in a methodologically controlled manner. And then we need to understand them. And I try to understand that in a functionalistic way. And here's what I understand. If something is persistent, i.e. if something happens in a repetitive manner and gets a structural value and it happens in a longer period of time, it seems to have proven itself. Something that proves itself is not necessarily a good thing, and also terrible things can persist and prove themselves or stand the test. And so if something stands the test, i.e. if an actor in society picks up on something and lets something persist, then it seems to be the case that whatever happened, whatever event you were able to observe seems to be solving a problem. I would like to cite a very simple example now. I'm standing in front of you now in a bright light. You can see it on my very wonderful haircut. The light is reflecting from here. You are sitting in the dark. I can hardly see you, but you can see me. I have a microphone. You don't have a microphone yet. 
45 minutes now to talk to you, to address you, and people trust me that I fill the time now to talk to you, to address you, and people trust me that I fill these 45 minutes with somewhat content-rich sentences. I already spent five of my minutes. And this is a very interesting setup. You could also imagine that the handover of and the sharing of such information of a good Bavarian ordinarian in the Prussian Berlin could happen in a completely different manner. But however, it somehow proved to be reasonable to have the listeners in a position that they all look in the same direction towards me in this case, and that this is almost a sermon-like situation, and that this creates a format in which I can unfold a thought in a linear manner from A to Z, from beginning to end. It sounds silly, maybe, but as a researcher, I wonder, why is that our format? Why is it not different? I could be in the center. You could maybe make a comment on any sentence I say, or, you know, whatever you may imagine. We could also agree that you very loudly discuss whatever I say. I don't want to go into greater detail, but we could ask the question, what problem does this setup solve? And you could come to the conclusion that this setup for a presentation has a functional point or a sense. And the point would be to be able to elaborate on a longer thought or a more complicated idea. And you all got used to this format. And uh, I can see, or as far as I can see, I should say, you sit very nicely in your chairs and you know how to behave tonight. And so do I. And what I do every day is giving presentation and speeches. And um, I will, I'm sure that I will be able to fill those 45 minutes. And that's not even funny. It's just the way you approach such a topic. And now we haven't even discussed digitalization yet. But I use that same approach in my work. Weirdly enough, it is the case that digital technologies have found their way into any part of our lives. It, mostly people seem to be taking it for granted. And criticism also takes it for granted that digital technologies try to spread. And so that's why I wonder, what problem does that solve? It's a methodologically controlled question. And I'm very serious about my methodolo methodologically controlled question. That was my first preliminary remark. The next chapter is chapter zero. It's not yet what I want to focus on exclusively. I'm talking about the technological sociological intuition. I claim that technologies can only establish themselves, or specific kinds of technologies, can only establish themselves if there is an issue, a problem in society. If that technology solves a problem that is conceivable within society, you don't need to know the problem beforehand in order to consider it a solution later. I have some examples for you. Irrigation systems, for example, think of the Mediterranean Sea and think of the early irrigation systems and you will uh, remember that they used a lot of energy, organizational and economic energy. Um, for them to be used. And that alludes to the fact that the society had an organizational problem with the fact that of trying to feed a growing population um, by having enough fields to grow crops where irrigation couldn't be trusted in a punctual sense anymore, but instead irrigation needed to be centralized. Or just think of the letterpress printing. What problem did that solve if you ask people who invented or maybe, let's say, promoted letter printing, their idea was to distribute the Holy Scriptures. After a very short period of time, people understood that they did not only distribute the Holy Scriptures, but also the criticism of it, and the criticism of the criticism of the criticism, etc., etc. And thus, there were other things that people learned. People thought about writing other books 
other than the Holy Scriptures, and more criticism arose, and suddenly literature or pornography came about, or more fact-based forms of argumentation came about, and that was only possible in a, in a society where, quite clearly, that problem waits for a solution and where people understand that they can say different sentences or things about the same topic. The, the letter printing would have not spread if in society that core of that problem would not have been conceivable. Before that, people would have never thought about spreading the Holy Scriptures because everything you need to know is in there already. Why would everybody need to read it? You only need to read it to find out that you can interpret it yourself. And that is very risky because at the same time, you understand that you can read it and interpret it in different manners. And I will talk about that later. Similar stories are conceivable about the steam engine. The steam engine requires a society where the use of power is a problem, because otherwise you wouldn't need a steam engine. You can uh, use it in a stationary manner or as a locomotive, let's say, without the steam engine. And the uh, locomotive, the um, discovery of uh, the United States in, in, and the uh, movement of the frontier would not have been possible. We could talk a lot about the cars or radio and television and the development of these things. And you could talk a lot about the problems, i.e. the problems that these technologies solved. And all these technologies persisted. But these types of technology also always didn't have an identical fun functional sense with the intentions of those who invented these technologies. So now what about digitalization? I would say, let's start with the result. I claim that digitalization re is a reaction to the invisibility, invisibility of its very content and also to society. Digital technologies do not only have something to do with um, digital data, but with all kinds of other data as well. An example, a ball bearing is a very analog piece of technology. In a ball bearing, you can build in sensors, and we do that today a lot, and these sensors receive, can collect information as to when the ball bearing is going to break, and before it breaks, you can replace it, and you can save a lot of money because the industrial processes are not being interrupted. And that's an example that has nothing to do or is not representative of the digital society, but it boils it, the digital society down to what it is. You need an experience that you learn through pattern. It's something that you don't necessarily see. So if you look at a ball bearing, you will not be able to see whether it's going to break soon or not. But and, and uh, with uh, technology and, and its digital um, implementation, this is possible. And the same thing rings true for society. I claim that the problem that digitalization is a solution for already existed in a digital, digital society where people didn't even have a computer. I trace this back to the establishment of modern Western na nation states in the late 18th, early 19th century with the coming about of nation states of capitalism that was decentralized into companies with to modern urbanization, modern infrastructure planning, etc. All these things have always existed in the history of humanity. People were able to get go back to an analog experience. So the question, how much green um, need to be cultivated in the proximity of a city in order to make sure that there was enough bread rolls for the people in the city is a very simple question, but it is a new question for a society where suddenly larger rooms were inhabited and these experiences needed to be calculated or counted, i.e. being digitalized. The question, how many teachers and educators does a society need that wants to promote education? This is another question. The question, how much medical supply 
needs to be guaranteed with a specific size of a city or how broad does a canal need to be for sewage to go through? How much material do you need, for equipment do you need to provide for an army? So the, all these questions have to, have to be answered with statistic means. So people had to look at the average person. And by looking at that, they were able to find answers. There was a completely new form of self-observing in society. So society observed itself. People observed the bourgeois society. The bourgeois society was so happy to have an individual as a subject that was strong and that was able to take its own decisions, but we saw that these people adhered to patterns and made decisions that were similar, and these patterns could be described in a quantitative ma manner. What is the behavior of people from different classes like? That was an important question for research at the time. You may be familiar with romantic love in literature. Romantic love in literature has lovers usually in, in the story, and these lovers trace back the entire world they live in to their subjectivity, and the authentic decisions that they take are important for the significant other. And then statistics experts come about and they find out that we fall in love according to very predictable patterns. Usually we fall in love with people of the same confession, religion, same educational background, um, but different sexes usually, um, and all these things do have an influence up until the present day. This, of course, is a humiliation, first and foremost. It's a humiliation that shows us, us that society itself, like a ball bearing, consists of patterns. And these patterns ha can only be made visible through um, data. And that's why I believe that the modern society, since the time that I mentioned, has been a digital society since then. The self-observing self society just changed. And if I want to answer the question, uh, what problem does digitalization solve, then I think one of the problems is this. It's the problem of the self-observation of modern society. Or, in order to use the term you used, it's about the complexity. So the multifactorial form of society that society describes in its processes. Earlier societies were very simple, even though they had very complex cultural forms. They were more simple when it comes to their practices, their worldviews. They were organized in clear hierarchies. Now we have several simultaneous um, aspects that are interdependent and that are no longer visible anymore. And now... I would like to move on further. Um, we could describe that in more detail. I did that in a written form, but not now. But you could imagine that the digital technologies that it are coming about would need to be invented if it wasn't already invented, because these technologies are able to do exactly what would solve uh, what, what can be called one of the biggest issues with self-observation self -observation of society. So what do computers do that were invented later, according to my understanding, more than 100 years later once when society was already digital. So the computers recombine elements, and these elements consist of things that the computer can see, i.e. data. And so the computer tries to find and detect structures within those data sets. These structures don't need to be there objectively, but they need to be made visible. A data set consists of different kinds of data, and the data does not seem to be similar or the same. They don't seem interlinked, but they do have a structure. And that is exactly what the computer can do with high potency. All right, so first, for the first time, we now get to a chapter with an actual number, chapter one.
So I'm interested in the technical sim, uh, substrate, which is the question, what is digital technology? For a sociologist who is not an um, IT lab, who is not a mathematician, there is an interesting differentiation that might be interested, uh, that might be obvious for sociologists like me, namely the difference between medium and form. But it's not only this differentiation, but it's also the difference between a simple medium that allows for complex forms. One could actually say that there's probably never been a technology as simple as digital technology. And that sounds silly if I say that, because we are dealing with uh, forms that can reach a complexity unknown before and a potential unknown before, and that has growth rates that nobody could have predicted. So why can we still say that the technology itself is incredibly simple? It is simple because the substrate, the basis for information is coded binarily. This simple form, which is the basis for all digital technologies, allows for complex forms. So it is very interesting to see that the same medium form can be used to organize the energy systems of an entire country, can be organized to program a space technology, can also be organized to allow for self-observation of society, for instance, with regard to climate change mitigation. That is a very current topic. But at the same time, the same substrate can provide us with electric toys, electric toothbrushes, and whatever else, all of these things. So the substrate is the same. The form can be endlessly complex. This might sound simple, but it's not, because it's the basis that allows this technology to go everywhere. There was one case before that in history, which is writing. Writing is not as simple, because we have 26 letters that can be capitalized, so that would then be 52, and they can be combined in endless variations. That means that there is not always the same sentence following one first sentence. Everything can be written down with this writing, and we therefore live in a world of writing. You might know the discourses that um, are currently uh, taking place in the area of writing, where uh, scientists are dealing with the question of that this writing then becomes the world that it is used, that it is written in. And the same thing holds true for data technology because it's a reference in and for itself. This is the case because data can only break out of this data in the form of data. This can then have consequences in the analog world because you can detonate a bomb with data technology and the bomb is not does not consist of data but it consists of explosive so this is not data anymore but the data itself only refers to data the philosophist who explained it most radically is Martin Heidegger he formulated it in a quite critical way, but he actually ended up saying that modernity replaces philosophy with cybernetics because data always refers to data. So that's quite a good explanation. 
And I am also referring to something that is highly discussed. The question, does data reflect the world the way it is? You know the discussions about algorithms that, for instance, um, calculate uh, the likelihood of uh, crimes being committed by certain people. So you can induce data and then deduce if somebody is likely to commit a crime. This is quite critical and criticized because these algorithms are based on gender inequality, social inequality in the USA, also with uh, a racial inequality. So all of these things are also reflected in the algorithms because they are the basis for their calculations. This shows us that the data is taken from our world, but it only reflects. And what it reflects is a tautology. They are not seeing the world objectively. Instead, they are what they stand for. And this is why I speak of the um, inexact exactness of data. We know, we have heard saying that scientists do not know how they develop their models. You know that in science, uh, scientists say that the models are what is being depicted, but there are a lot of um, inaccuracies. And we know this from social science as well. We um, interview people and then calculate to a very detailed point certain uh, results and then realize that the data itself is contingent, as we say. It's inaccurate. So the self-reference of this data world somehow allows a duplication of the world. And I'm using this theorem of the duplication of the world in order to describe in an ironical way that we see another duplication in data, which is something that we know from language and writing. So there is this major problem between, between significance and signifié from the world of language that we know of what is being described and what is describing. And this is then depicted again in data. So data depicts structural differences in tensions. But they stand for something they can only stand for because they do not represent and cannot represent what they stand for themselves. I would like to give you a simple example. We know that the word tree is not a tree. But when discussing and negotiating about trees, we use the word tree. And for trees it's quite easy because this is self-describing, but at times it's difficult to understand what something stands for, for instance, freedom or digitalization or technological substrate or simplicity or diversity all of these words that I am also using here on my slide. So this form of duplication of the world then leads to digitalization representing the world that has a certain life of itself. This means that just like society was duplicated by language and writing, it is now duplicated by data. Interestingly enough, we have to say that data itself does not contain information, but the information is held by those who observe this data. An example is that one data set can be used for answering questions of criminology or marketing or medical research or identifying uh, target groups for your next elections if you don't want to spend too much money on this campaign and make sure that you only spend it on those who are still insecure about what they will vote. That was, for example, one of the strategies that the first Obama campaign used in the United States. Another aspect of the techn technological substrate 
is the so-called increase of options. The modern society does not know stop signs, so to say. As a system theorist, I think that we have a differentiated society where religious, um, scientific, etc. logics are not differentiated because they have nothing to do with one another, but they reproduce themselves with their own rules. And we then see increases in options. This is the famous problem of capitalism. We cannot stop capitalism with economic means. Impossible. We can try to do so with political means. And this is the major conflict, but with economic means it does not work. And there is no stop sign in the economic field. And the economies of the 20th century are a good scientist for this. In nuclear technology uh, and also um, increases in options so with regard to religion was highly discussed in the past. And this, interestingly enough, also holds true for the duplication of the world. Writing and language cannot be stopped with writing and language. So we cannot, we are not to use certain words, for example, and in order to strengthen them, we have to use them. For instance, when we say, don't say the word X, then we have to use this word X. And even by only denominating it indirectly, we did denominate it. So the data world does not know any stop sign in itself. And this is kind of the mysterium about data, that in its simplicity, it can be used for everything. And that's why forms of interconnectedness, of um, connectivity, is what the digital society is marked by today. So we are all connected. Data is being used for something that it was not gathered for. Data from different areas of society become connective for other areas. And we might then talk about examples during the discussion. And of course, I would also like to say something about the digitality of society. I say that this is the reference problem of digitalization. One might now say, well, what else might be uh, the result of a sociologist? My answer to this is, well, exactly. This is the result. Because we are talking about the digitality of society. We are talking about the analog invisibility. Traditional societies always relied on their analog patterns that always held true. However, today we see that every solution produces a new problem. Every solution does. We are always seeing new problems, and I've said so already. So what I think is interesting, and I hope you do too, is a third discovery of society. When do we discover society? And this now goes back to history. We always discover society when we see a mixture of being able to shape something and this peculiar experience that society somehow seems to be stronger than the will of the individual. I think that the first discovery took place at the beginning of the 19th century after the French Revolution. Interestingly in, enough, in France it was uh, promoted by right-wing uh, writers, uh, Jean de Mestre, for example. The second discovery might have taken place in the 60s and 70s. So not only the movement of 68, but also the planning of social life to allow for social um, promotion, to discuss the social background of problems and the general equality of people and to see all of these problems based on society itself. And the third discovery is today's digital technology. You might now say that when I say 
I have said it started much earlier. That's not true now about the third discovery, but it still holds true because this third discovery does not necessarily discover something new, but something that we have known for a while, namely the social structure that makes us do what we do and want what we want. That's the old formula of the civil society. So the third discovery of society means that digital technology lives of a certain um, feature of society, namely inertia. So we can deduce a lot from little information. With little information, we can recombine certain elements and thus create a lot of uh, deductions and information. And we can deduce certain knowledge from data about future behavior of humans. In marketing, for example, we can deduce purchase decisions that those who will purchase don't even know about yet. This could be very positive, but it could also be critical. And what is interesting is that this third discovery of society leads to new control mechanisms. We have heard criticism of the old book world and a surplus of control of this new digital world. So this patternness of society is the material for digitalization and the technicity is the key for its success. And therefore, I also need to talk about technology. We differentiate technology from humanity. And you know this discourse that it's technology and not human. But that doesn't make sense because there are human technologies. For example, if you dance, you need certain uh, techniques. And if you uh, draw, you need certain techniques. And when doing so, you don't even need to think about it. In sport, the same holds true. When playing uh, football, you don't need to think about how to shoot a ball. Once you have automated it, you have a certain technique ready. Technicists themselves have um, a certain culture and we ask ourselves, is technology the opposite of culture? When looking at technology in everyday life, we see, and this is a theory by Niklas Luhmann, that technology does not need consents if it works. And this becomes clear where we have technological social structures. Let's not think about machines, but um, about technological communication. So if, for example, you need to talk to somebody at a desk because you want to buy a ticket, a train ticket to Stuttgart, it's quite probable that the person behind this desk does not ask you, do you think that's uh, necessary? Or ask you, how do you think uh, this one football club will play against the other? These are not questions that you will be asked, but you will be asked, wouldn't you rather like to buy this kind of ticket? Or wouldn't you like to take t this train instead? telling you maybe even how much it costs. So in everyday life we have a lot of um, communication that is very standardized and we do not need to tell the person in this case behind the desk that they should not talk about whatever but sell you a ticket because everyone knows what is expected. So this is already something that is set in stone. And therefore I'm using this example to show you that this kind of technology does not need a consensus, but it works because it works. That means that we can use technologies that we ourselves don't necessarily understand. It's almost always kind of a black box. For example, um, everyone can drive a car without knowing how a car works. Hardly anyone knows what happens when you uh, accelerate. Well, the car definitely starts driving, but we don't need to know what 
this actually means. So the interesting part here is that technology is a simplification because it interlinks all elements. It's not a loose coupling anymore. That would, for instance, be asking somebody, would you like to go out for dinner or to the movies tonight? And then this person might say, well, neither. But technology can't do that. If it works, it does what it is supposed to do. If it doesn't, it's broken. So this simplification through technology allows for the establishment of a high degree of complexity. And the same holds true for this simple medium, the simplified medium of technology that produces complex forms. We could then say that this term function is too positive because functioning does not necessarily mean that it functions well, but it means that it works in society. So we all complain about certain technologies while still using them. Especially the digital technologies are very complicated with regard to their form. However, the application becomes more and more easy. I am old enough to remember MS Boss, where you had to enter certain um, had to enter certain commands in order to receive a result. But this technology only became suitable for the masses once you only had to click on certain symbols. So if it works, it works, and if it doesn't, if it works, it will probably prevail. I distinguish between acting and experiencing technology. Everything I've described just now is experiencing technology. It's a technology that uses data and media to do something with it. But the more difficult and exciting questions arise with the technology that starts making its own decisions. So, for example, a technology that... Um, produces its own data sets. Self-driving cars cannot go back to using data sets, but instead these vehicles need to produce their own data sets with sensors, cameras, etc. These vehicles have to decide which piece of information from the outside becomes a, p a piece of information on the inside. And then that leads me to the question, is that still a technology that still works and functions in this way? If I had more time, I would tell you more about the mathematical background uh, of that problem, the problem of the uh, paradox of the beginning, but I don't have enough time for that tonight, and this is why I want to be brief and summarize. I would like to um, tell you that the abductive ma machines, as I call them, cannot go back to a, a large data set, but instead they do what we do as well. They struggle and have to begin with the uh, paradox elements of the beginning. We do learn a lot about humans themselves. The paradox of the beginning is the um, beginning of many mistakes. You may be familiar with the phrase, this is only human. So that means this mistake can be forgiven. So let's say we have an accident. And the human element of an accident is, is that due to our own weakness in perception, we were not able to prevent the accident. A technology wouldn't be uh, granted this excuse. This is why we discuss exciting questions in ethics. For example, should a self-driving car run over an older person or a child? And now my last slide. At the moment, uh, we uh, experience an overheating, and it's not uh, weather-related overheating that we see. No, the de many things in society are overheating. I talked about the surplus and criticism and control. For example, at this point, we do not know for sure who is the controller and who is the controlee in the cybernetics discussion. This is a major issue. But I would now like to leave it where it is now. We see a high 
degree of overheating, a heated debate in the concentration of capital. Interestingly enough, this year I learned that Google Plus had to stop operating, um, apparently because of a data leakage, but no um, bigger company has ever been forced into stopping operating due to data leakage. No, the competition with Facebook didn't work anymore because the concentration of data in two places put into question the uh, business model. And so the form of concentration of these technologies needs to be uh, resourced with technological information. Let's just think of the forms of concentration of the coal processing industry and all the related things that come with that. And we have to say that uh, several technologies led to the fact that capital concentrated in specific areas. The capital concentration today is something that has had an influence of economic um, prosperity that could be traced back to um, fossil elements that were used. So purely digital economies have to be rethought, especially when it comes to forms of um, property, of the source of value creation and all these things that we've learned from the 19th century, from capitalism, the um, impact and influence of productive forces. So we also see an overheating in a discussion, a discussion of the control of these developments. And that also rings true for the um, dynamics of in information paths, because today we almost have gatekeepers in public communication that we set up, these gatekeepers. And also, there is a new observer role when it comes to processing accessible data. I call that observing people while observing. This is what we do on social media. We observe others how they observe other things, and that is then in turn observed again. And that unfolds a dynamic that works very differently from the uh, public communication and the functioning thereof, the way sociologists usually describe it. Towards the end, I would like to give you a piece of advice as to what you can do with a theory like that and how you can use it. The data protection regulation of the EU is a good example here. This regulation serves the purpose to provide legal um, background to um, how information is being processed. Um, in my generation, we pro protested the census at the time, which is maybe funny today, because if you uh, walk down the train station, you leave many more traces uh, than people have in the past with the census. But this topic seems to be relevant. And it seems unlikely that people would think this self-determination of information as a concept, because the observer of the data is more important, and so the data that is being generated through what you do is nothing that you can determine. You may determine how much of your data is being forwarded and passed on, but informationally, for categorical categorical re reasons, you cannot be self-determined here. You may think I'm splitting hairs here intellectually, but I think there's more to it. I think describing these chains in information processing that are being enabled through a technology that that leads the terminology um, at absurdum that we use. If you've bought an app once on your phone, you maybe checked a box um, agreeing to something or you signed a piece of paper um, when you handed over data sets. This is technological inf information. And if you don't check a box or if you don't sign the piece of paper, you don't get the app or you cannot get more data. But you're so used to just checking the boxes that this is a technicized form of communication and this is being ritualized and it's becoming persistent. You may have a critical attitude towards that, but you can also be more descriptive about it and just determine that this 
these categories are being mixed up. I was not very uh, passionate in my presentation. I have to um, con uh, admit that, but I would end with a more pa passionate quote. The end is open. Is it a gaining of uh, more freedoms or is it the end of civilization? Well, we will see. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Mr. Nasehi, for this very lucid presentation. I have to begin with a very relevant issue that you just briefly addressed in your presentation before I uh, excuse me about the continuum, continuous modernity. So you said everything is already set up and. If I'm not mistaken, you were born in Gelsenkirchen and you've been in Munich for 20 years now and you have this a very strong feeling about the soccer rivalry between Schalke and Munich. So are you a Schalke fan or a Munich fan? My son is a Bavaria Munich fan, which I think um, makes a, a test um, necessary to find out whether he's actually my son or not. Does that lead to stab stability or instability? in the family. Well, we do get along. We can handle it. So when I read and when I listened to your presentation, that was remarkable because the most counterintuitive things, as you use it in your book, is digitality. Digitality needs stable functional systems in modernity, and it, it, it unveils them. It's something that we wouldn't expect. I said it in my introduction very briefly. We usually expect that to happen in other fields or in other ways. Digitalization or digitality has um, not come about with modernity. Digitalization has come about with modernity. So there are functional systems that are similar to digitality and networks that do something else. Do networks solve functional, uh, do, do, do they step in for functional systems or is there something new coming about? I would like to correct you very briefly. I have never claimed that functional systems are stable. That would uh, be a very um, peculiar diagnosis. But what I do claim is that the basic coding of the functional systems are super stable. An example, there are countless opportunities to act and work economically. So the diversity of forms is huge. Look at capitalism history. In the history of capitalism, there were countless ways in which you could do things. And these countless ways, this diversity is the result of a very simple thing. The basic coding of economic things is that you need to make a profit. You can act out of the best motives economically and also for, for the worst reasons, but you can only act economically if you remain solvent. The same thing rings true for politics. The political system is anything but stable, but the basic coding of that system is super stable. Whether you have the power or not, whether the, you can get it or not, whether power is in danger or not. However you achieve power, this is something that you cannot betray. And even scientific phrase statements are not true or false, but they are treated as correct, otherwise they wouldn't be scientific statements. And that is interesting. I would like to set up an analogy to the digital world. Well, the analogy is this. It is not a coincidence that in a modern society these systems are ultra-stable and being described as such through binary systems. They then enable countless forms and and that is why our society is, can hardly be grasped. So the solution is always a new
new problems. So that means we are familiar with the history and no history of modernity as an attempt to politically control all things economic. So modernity is the attempt to scientifically enlighten the political world. world. Modernity tries to rule and, and create the best opportunities through competition, but none of that is indefinitely successful. But that is part of the structure of modernity, and that's now my answer to your question. So on the basis of this stability, of these stabilities, we create more network structures, more solutions in a local or global sense, in a smaller way or a greater way. And that to us seems to lack structure. But if you take a closer look, it is more structured than we think. And the same applies to cultural constraints. So today you would say cultural things are dissolving, and now you have to look uh, in, back into history, what, they, what historians say. Here in Europe, we are stuck so deep in long-term cultural codings, I would call it maybe, but constraints is maybe a more fitting word. So we are stuck in forms that are perpetuating themselves against the intuition of those who are actually doing something. And this is why I call my book Patterns, because there are patterns that are fairly stable, and as they are so stable, our society is so volatile. Functional systems are not stable. This is uh, would be a wrong summary. The political system of our international community is anything but stable. But the mechanism of um, power, of power mechanisms, is fairly stable. I do have a sound issue. So, do people hear me, or am I on the monitors online? Um, so we do need to make sure that our tech technicians actually get the sound on their devices over there. Okay, it seems to be working now. So, just for me to make it more clear, wouldn't you say that once networks are more important, and you refer to this uh, as the brutally simple basic coding of systems, that once that this is being put out because the networks allow for more than wrong, false, efficient, non-efficient. There is more solutions in a simultaneous manner. So Becker would maybe say that a basic concept of the modernity is now being replaced with something else, or are these things interconnected? Well, I disagree with Becker here, but if you take a closer look, he's also more cautious. He says functional differentiation is over now, but he's more cautious there. Harrison White, a US networks theorist, would say this. He himself described this in economic terms. So how do perceive economic actors the economic system? They do that with a network structure. They look at where specific structures exist, and, and that's where they piggyback, basically. And modernity is a network structure. We we look at our social, old social democratic model and we try to enable modern capitalism in order to provide for large parts of society. That doesn't happen through the isolation of uh, functional and systemic coding, but through political programs that have a network structure and that go and can communicate and want to communicate beyond borders. I am a scientist and I would like to be heard by other people who do work in their functional systems, sometimes that works. But what's interesting is this. The others don't have to solve scientific problems, but religious, economic, or political problems, you name it. And that is an interesting network structure. Today, we live in a world where digitalization through data sets that we have and through recombination capabilities of potential information density leads to the fact that there are so many possible network links, so many connectivities that go back at the end of the day to the brutal simplicity. And I, I wouldn't negotiate that. I think this is the most radical diagnosis of modernity. 
I use the term of term brutality not for fun. It is in a way brutal, not only because it's a fact in brutum, but this is the solid basis, basis of what we're trying to do. Anybody who has ever tried to do something economically or politically will be catapulted back to this basic coding. Corruption is a great network. If I want to bribe somebody to do something for me politically and to make a specific political decision, I can do that with money, of course, but I cannot buy that with money, but the person who was bribed has to then use that logic to do it. This person can't go to the parliament and say, I have 100,000 euros now, and I will share the money with you if we take this in that decision, but the person can't do that as a scientist, you can't say, oh, this footnote is being presented to you by Mercedes-Benz, and this is why my argument this or that. You can be bribed by Mercedes-Benz, but, but unfortunately they haven't called me yet. In Switzerland it's different. Corruption uh, is a tax deductible. Well, this is a very economic uh, transaction. These are operational costs, if you will, and if that works as operational costs, then that works in your political system, but in a political system you still can't communicate that, not even in Switzerland, I believe. I've been quite away, uh, quite a uh, long time um, outside of Switzerland for now. Well, I'll ask them tomorrow. I'll go to Switzerland. I would like to uh, talk more about stability and instability because I find that so interesting and surprising. I would like to cite another example, or several maybe, that some people would consider an expression of instability and others may not. What would you think? Let's talk about the increase in justice, inclusion, participation, gender equality. Many people consider this to be a a factor of instability because the uh, number of those who are part of a, con a public conversation are is now increasing and new rules of the game need to be set up which is exhausting that some people perceive to be a factor of instability the educational offensive um, quote unquote um, is another aspect then we have uh, the me too debate and the development in german museums and um, for example if we see a group of males sitting together is something that catches more attention than years ago. Does that have to do in some way, shape or form with the instability of functional mechanisms or with the instability of historical developments? Well, both. That is so exciting. All the debates that you just mentioned are following a certain sense of a tradition. I don't want to strengthen traditions here, no, but what's interesting is this. We're still finding ourselves in the dialectics of movement and stanza, structure and process. And we are aware of that. There are normative forms that also still work in, its, in their negative form. People sometimes claim that there's inequality between people, and you can claim that because that happens in the in, against the backdrop of the equality-inequality debate. In the past, it was clear a peasant wasn't as uh, worthy of a human as a bourgeois. So the documentation itself itself alludes to stability. It's not about stability, though. It's about the stability of patterns for me. And that is the business foundation of sociology. What do empirical social researchers do? We look at certain forms. And even if you want to overcome those forms, these forms seem to be more stable than we think, these patterns, if you will. I research uh, medical sociology a lot, um, palliative medicine, multiprofessional teams in hospitals, etc. We have we are dealing with people who make decisions, but at the same time we deal with patterns that these people move within and not coincidentally so. And so digitalization, to establish a link, makes use of the predictability of specific structures to then deduct certain results. And empirical social research has always been humiliating to people in the sense that people were not able to imagine that our behavior is as boring as it actually is. 
In many presentations, I started out by saying that not because I like myself so much, because it was very boring. I talked about my taste in music, about my uh, aesthetics, the way I live, about something that I consider morally correct. I talked about my way of talking, of dressing, you name it. So all these things are not necessarily predetermined, but you could also say that there is nobody that was more boring than I am. And I'm not trying to be flattered. You don't know me well enough. But I read your book. And you're uh, writing in your book about your car. We can car talk about that later. I'm driving a Mercedes E-Class, which is the older, uh, the, the car that an older, overweight German man drives. And it's, it's under-motorized. But I would li now like to talk about about music, and I would like, like to talk about the humiliation that you mentioned in your book, the humiliation caused by predictability that we have to suffer through, especially when it comes to the digital patterns that you describe. And so you're talking about music, you're talking about Bach. And you're talking about how similar music is suggested to you um, due to the comparative algorithms in Spotify or other streaming services. And there are good experience, of course, but all these go back to patterns. And sometimes you were quite unhappy with the fact that you were so predictable in your music taste. Is that maybe Bach? Because Bach is a very mathematical composer. And uh, because I have different experience with my music style. Well, to say so quite clearly, my description here is a description of the forms and namely that with computer technology we tried to explain the musical principle of Bach and the machine was then asked to do Bach music and uh, it actually sounds like his music this also works with other kinds of music his music naturally is very mathematical but it was also tried with different kinds of music so that's quite a simple form what's more interesting about this question is that even the aesthetical form that we know, and this is the actual humiliation, are relatively predictable. And with predictable, I do not mean that they have no ethical worth, but the sociologist takes a look and says, it's surprising to see that patterns outweigh the irregularities, so there is certain um, consistency, there is uh, little, um, the little accidents. I would like to give you an example from um, empirical sociology. We are currently talking a lot about gender studies. And from a first glance, we could say that this underlines a large disruption because we now see that women are humans. And that's not a joke, but it was quite a late invention in human history to see that women are uh, actual humans and actual subjects. For example, thinking about the voting rights for women in Switzerland, giving something back to Switzerland, took place in 1971. Well, 71, that's something. Now, what I want to say with this is that it's interesting that we want to describe that everything could be different, but then gender studies and gender research interestingly see the persistence of patterns and behaviors that are more traditional than the intentions of those who are behaving this way. So that's an interesting question. For me, this is the most interesting aspect of gender studies because there are these large normative uh, intentions to say things do not necessarily be to, need to be this way, but when looking at the practice we see that men who talk differently or they talk well they talk different from how they behave so this is the impetus of the sociologist we do not want to say that nothing is changing a lot is changing but I'm pointing out that the society is a digital one meaning that we can only 
understand its structure through observation and be interested in these patterns. And this is what technological digitalization does. And this also holds true for other current topics and could be done there. Our behavior is more racist than the way we talk, even that of those benevolent one of us. Why is this the case? Because these are obviously structures that we that are hard to get rid of. Pierre Bourdieu is our reference author for this. He described it best, I think. He describes it also for those who describe it. And I like best his idea of um, the intellectual sitting at his desk all day and writing on a piece of paper. He can construct his own world and thinks that he is creating something and is then surprised that others have different references and thereby realizes that he's actually doing the same thing as everyone else, namely acting in his case and in, with his social background. So my simple thesis actually is the object of digitalization is this kind of patternness of society. And what I'm not describing enough in the book, I think, is the question of what do we do with this? This then has consequences for certain behavior. So the behavior in itself is now expecting that we change the be that we can change the behavior of humans by calculating it by calculating ourselves by observing ourselves because we have machines that tell us how far we have walked today how much we have of this or that how much connectivity there was and this then has influence on the behavior in itself as i said this is a solution and this solution then leads to a problem and there will be new solutions for these problems so this is the rather simple idea. Well, I think I read that you already do so. At the end of your book, you describe some scenarios saying how we can act differently in digitality and you present some solutions for this. You talk about the climate, for instance. However, what I'm interested in before coming back to the major topics and before allowing for some questions, within this patternness, within this digital paradigm that, paradigm that you're describing, where are there emotions or uh, surprises? Because I have a different experience with Spotify, because I don't hear classical music on Spotify. I listen to pop music, and Spotify is very bad at uh, suggesting similar music, because it just doesn't understand the voice of a singer or a single sound that makes a song. So it's only based on what other people listen to and it's not about what kind of songs I'm listening to. Algorithms apparently don't know yet. Um, we had other services like Last.fm that did not succeed in this either. So I am missing the surprise, the uniqueness, this something that is not a pattern that leads to a certain joy in listening to this music. And where does this take place? I could talk a lot about pop music, but I won't. And last year, I published a book about 68 in which I tried to describe this kind of issue a lot. But I would like to get back to your idea of surprising and um, exciting ideas. I would like to point out a paradoxy. So what is a shift? We have talked about um, shifting, deviating behavior in uh, crimes. For example, we saw that when young people commit crimes, they do not have a deviating behavior, but they stick to the code of their peer group and thus commit crimes. This means that this idea of deviation takes place within this paradigm. This is exactly what happens when we detect patterns. We look at certain patterns and ask for possible deviations. How is it possible to make people buy something that they would never have bought? How do we make people vote something they never thought they would? How do we make people do something they never thought they would? In the medical area, this plays a ever large role how to change this behavior disposition. So knowledge is the worst uh, 
predictive factor for um, behavior. I'm too small for my weight, and I know how to change this, but I don't succeed. So it's not the knowledge about it, but it's the way of finding forms for, well, how to include deviations in everyday life that then allows for this result. And these patterns are gained from these data sets. Medical science is currently filled with this. Exactly this is done. And the same holds true for election campaigns. So deviation is great if, it's happen, if it happens in a way that the pattern is still visible. So uh, deviation actually requires stability. Just just like it deviation does in uh, criminal science. So it would be much better if we said, well, this horrible society is so stable, let's just live the way we want to live. And this is what makes us do a lot of things. And then we see that all these alternatives, all these deviations are repeated within society. In the 70s, there were mm, trials for alternative economies, which worked for a while. However, when crises came up, they uh, were organized in an even more hierarchical way than others, because these crises led to a situation in which the intention did not work anymore, but things needed to be done. So patterns were repeated. It was usually the guys uh, screaming loudest that uh, led the way and not the smartest ones, just like in real life. You're writing very interesting things in your book also uh, about surveillance in modern society. You also talk about privacy that was never as private as we would have liked it to be. So, before um, allowing for some questions, I would like to ask you about the uh, time factor. Current surveillance uh, discussions seem to focus on this more than in the past. So, this relation with those who carry out the surveillance is a very continuous one. There's hardly any way out. There's no break. Compared to the 19th century, where there was city planning or the police uh, um, doing surveillance, uh, looking into um, your post or whatever, um, these took place at certain points in time. But today, the surveillance is continuous. It doesn't stop. And I think this now has a new quality. Does this make a qualitative difference? Well, yes, it definitely does. Becker used the uh, control surplus term here. So this is the reality in the um, expectation. We are afraid of being controlled, and data allows for this. A lot can be done with this data if it's organized properly. Thinking of China, for example, much more can be done with data than we can even imagine. So we are worried about a control surplus. I'm interested in the fact that these negative diagnoses often lead to the idea of saving something that has ne had never been there. So you mentioned some of these surveillance incidents, but you forgot the most important one. The... Um, own, um, your very own conscience was the most important surveillance factor. And I mentioned this already. If you want to describe a modern way of living in society, if you talk about being controlled by others or controlling yourself, the free human is the one where wanting something and um, being ought to do something are the same things. So doing something out of your own will. We have learned about Foucault and about his ideas and we know this. But today we realize that a lot of what worked as a conscience is now externalized, meaning that we are threatened by those who observe and surveil us. It's not necessarily the police breaking into your flat, but it's about this new technology 
breaking into your privacy, be it others listening through your microphones or seeing you through your computer camera. That's all possible. But it's also about the behavioral patterns, this little information that leads to a lot of information. And there are these control mechanisms. There are companies gaining money with checking the um, the financial background of certain people through their online um, profiles, for example, their creditworthiness. And this question, therefore, is a very important one. Do we want this? We should, therefore, always keep this in mind. Well, thank you. So we now have two microphones. No, we have one microphone. I cannot see you too well, I must admit. But please raise your hand if you would like to ask a question. Later on, we will also take a look at questions on Twitter. Hello, my name is Romerto Smanowski. I'm a media scientist. I deal with digital media myself. Therefore, I was very interested in your interesting uh, lecture. And I also already read your book. I liked your uh, cool perspective of the system theorist with a view to these uh, studies on digitalization. However, I've also heard you say that every solution leads to a new problem, and I find this understandable. When digital technology helps society in gaining knowledge and fulfilling its desire to um, observe itself, this can lead to problems. When there is a knowledge surplus, this can be unhealthy for society. I'm thinking of radical transparency, for instance, which would not be healthy for our coexistence. One reference point for this could be the a sociologist Kurt Zimmer who said that the secret is a very important gain of society and this is now threatened. I'm therefore interested in your opinion. Could you say something about this and could you also give a, another idea on a reference text from Zimmer as well, who talked about the own logics of technology. Future generations cannot avoid this for themselves. So the question would therefore be if we are using technology because we need it as a society, because it solves a problem, or if technology has its own agenda. So does technology not save our problems anymore, but only act as though it were doing so, but is making us its objects? Well, there are several interesting um, aspects here. So, regarding your questions, when it comes to the relations of solution and problems, I actually mean it. I don't mean that there is a solution for each problem, but this is a methodological tool which shows me that one solution can be the reference problem for something else. Letterpress printing is such a great reference because we know a lot about it and we can look at it from a historical distance. It solved many problems, but it created new reference problems. So a lot that we talked about, the self-controlled subject of the Western modernity, is the result of the problem that everyone can speak now. Everyone is allowed to say something, so it needs to be controlled in what way it does so. And this is quite interesting. Social media, in the way we know it these days, have a promise that modernity always had, namely that everyone is allowed to participate in the discussion and everyone does so now. Carl Schmidt wanted to um, prohibit it. Yes, he did, because it was a horizon. 1917. 
Well, yes, that was part of the horizon of a new philosophy of Karl Schmitt. And I will get back to that in a minute. That was part of his um, anti-enlightenment. Encoding it this way was quite ingenious, but he produced a new problem because he took it seriously. And by seriously, I mean that he didn't take it as coding. Theologically speaking, he described this as a differentiation. As a Catholic thinker, you can only see it this way. But that is what you meant. Every solution leads to deviations. And these then need to be balanced again. That's the problem that I'm talking about. We are currently seeing that many solutions, for example, that everyone is allowed to participate in the discussion leads to problems that we need to solve. Looking at simple solutions, at newspapers, solving problems by moderating this discussion, which is a very modern aspect. It's kind of a teacher-like form. Do you think this actually is a solution? Let me repeat this. Solution means that we are prepared to deal with the consequences. It does not mean that it's a good solution or a bad solution. One solution, for instance, is that many newspapers have online services and when it comes to topics such as refugees, they do not allow for comments to be made. So there is no discussion. And this is authoritarian because actually everyone is supposed to be able to participate. So this is what I mean by saying it leads to new problems. In the economic sphere, added value is decoupled from, mm, from objects these days. And this leads to problems that need to be solved. And these solutions need to be ways of dealing with it. You mentioned in the own life of technology. That's also interesting. You said that we as a society were doing something here. But I'm always critical when saying we as society. I'd rather use an evolutionary approach saying that technology is developing its own dynamics. No technology does exactly what those who invented it planned it for, but it seems to have a certain life of its own. Digital technology is the example for this. Evolution means dealing with certain deviations. This then leads to a structure that, and we've dis discussed this today, Janet, could have ended differently. So the question is, what is the criteria for a different result? I mentioned Howard Reingold earlier who had a more positive normative description in the 80s, in the B area, I think. They said everyone has access to everything, every data storage is open for everyone, this is democracy. And a sociologist might have said, well, if everyone is allowed to participate and can say everything, we will generate certain problems. We reach structures that can have weird consequences. And this is how this actually works. There was another question. I'm Rainer Reag from the Helmholtz Institute for Network Societies. I would like to say that I would have preferred to have a female person ask a question first, but structural topics are diff difficult to address usually. But now on to my question. The term or phrase digitalization is something that interests me a lot. I haven't used it the way you have, and it's, it's because I can't grasp it so well, because sometimes I think it is automation, uh, computerization, maybe it's also just a play on words of, of those who lack society and who uh, prepare for revolution. I have a more technical background and I'm asking my question because technology asks us what purpose it should pursue and 
It can have different, there are different answers to this ask uh, questions, and technology could always be used in different ways, and so now we try to shape how we use technology. So the question, what problems we can use with tele, um, we, we can solve with digitalization implies many more other aspects for me. And maybe you can um, say a few more words about that. Thank you for your presentation. Well, a question is never an argument, but you make an argument in your question. This is a great question that I want to answer uh, straight away, but I would like to be a bit cheeky. May I? It is very much expected that somebody gets up. It would be would have been much better if we'd had the questions beforehand where I told you in my presentation that the format that condemned you to silence was a functional solution for a reference problem. This is how social orders work. Even criticism is to be expected. And it's nothing against your comment. You may be right. I, I've been very comfortable up here. But it's quite interesting uh, to see that these patterns seem to be fairly stable. But now on to your question. These were two questions. So one question was this, what does digitalization actually mean? And secondly, my answer may be too general. So on your first question, I think I made quite clear how I see digitalization, how I define it, first of all. It's a very trivial distinction between anal analog visibility and a digital translation to make structures visible that you can't see with analog means. This is my basis, my foundation. And then, and you may know more about that than I do, I think I tried to fairly appropriately and describe the technical substrate, technical aspects themselves, to describe them in order to use then that to use that then as a metaphor in order to describe forms of society. For example, the dialectics between simplicity and complexity, um, that doesn't solve the problem, but I think this is what I was trying to do. And that leads me to the second part of your comment and question. You're right. That was very general, what I said, and possibly what you said, if I understood you right, this is already part of the next problem because you have a very general narrative where the term itself and its duplication um, generates something that needs to be researched empirically in more detail. So for technical reasons, I would agree with you here now, but at the same time, and I do have to uh, do that, I have to refer you to literature, because I do believe that in my book, I try to make a distinction between experiencing and acting technology, and with that, I'm alluding to something that questions the digitalization discourse in a normative sense because technologically something new is happening that you cannot describe or no longer describe with the terms that we use and I think I tried to do that in my presentation so that forced consensus and the trivial functioning where you don't really need to pay attention anymore no longer works with specific kinds of technology and that's something that I alluded to and that's the way we need to go and that's how we need to think, and I think this is one of my, the neuralgic points in my line of argument. Are there uh, questions that popped up under our Twitter hashtag? Maybe short questions. I think there's another question in the second row. There are many questions from our Twitter community. The first question is this. What about the interactive, physical, communicative, and necessary natures of complex functioning technologies? Is that the blind spot of systems theory? Oh, I thought that now we had the easy question. Can you please repeat that seriously? I, th I, I saw that coming. What about the interactive, physical, communicatively necessary repairs of the complex reducing uh, functioning technologies? Is this the blind spot of systems theory? 
Würden Sie antworten, bitte? Would you please also, answer that question? Ich, ich hoffe, I hope I understood the question correctly. That does contain a certain sense of irony. Aber, um, I, I noticed that for sure. But I don't try to be ironic now, but uh, instead try to give an honest response. So what is meant is this, that there is also another form of communication that has been mediatized through different people. For example, what we do here, it's a very artificial situation, but the blind spot, I don't think it is the blind spot, it's something else. In my book, I say the very important spot that is very important to me that most commentators have not even highlighted, which is my fault, of course, I describe that especially the discussion, the discourse about digitalization and AI, which I didn't even address here because we would need much more time for that, that in that discussion, you can learn about the physical intelligence, and I take that very serious, this idea. What does that mean? Well, in the discourse and discussion of digitalization and the formalization of decision-making tools or through the formalization, the mathematical formalization of judgments as acting technology, through acting technology, we come to the following result. The whole thing has a paradox form because it has to begin somewhere. I mentioned that the paradox form of this we all know that consists in the fact that we never begin thinking because we have always be already begun to think. And that cannot ex be explained very well. The brain that we use, we, we use in a finite body, and this body gets to its finite point in a specific at a specific point in time, and it can therefore be described as something that is not a completely determined and formally logical system and cannot be represented as such. And if that thought is correct, and I assume that it does is correct, then this is a hint to the fact that from the criticism of AI, that is not a criticism of AI itself, but in the peculiar expectations that people place in AI, from that criticism, you can learn something about the limited um, perspectives of human intelligence. And this is why we still need that distinction, which also proves the fact that this is not the blind spot of my systems theory, but that is something that we need to think about further. I do admit that my brief explanation is not very transparent, but you have to trust me on that one now, otherwise I would like to refer you to literature. There are more Twitter questions, I assume that was only the first one. Okay, the next question from the Twitter community. Um, are there more things that uh, happen through externalized yeah. data control that we yeah, used to Sinne, conduct differently in the past? Yes. Sagen, and I would go even further. I would say that not only control, but also things that we ourselves externalize are um, looking at what we internally in our psychology did as self-control that has now is now being conducted through outside control. I think of my own life. I am in a network with myself through digital technologies. That is interesting. I have devices that remind me of certain things that my conscious should remind me of. But for capacity reasons, because my life is the way it is, I forget things. I do need to and externalize things, and I have done that. And I said earlier that externalization forces us to do things just as our conscience used to do that. And that is a form of observation as well, and that determines us and also gives us a certain sense of selectiveness. The Chinese scoring system can also be used and cited as an example here now, which also bestimmte Formen von Gewissensbildung bereits so funktionieren, dass man relies on certain and a certain sense of how to build a conscience where this new system was implemented against very little resistance. This describes exactly what we were talking about. Let's just hope that we will be spared this development. Are there more questions? 
Yes, there is another one. What is a purely digital market in which, quote unquote, the form of value creation and does away with the old theories of the 20th century. Is there an example for that? Yes. Very trivial examples. Uber, for example. Uber is a very valuable company that owns nothing. It does not own a single vehicle. It doesn't even own the drivers. And, and you can't own drivers, but you can um, command them, if you will. So the fact itself that there's a connection between specific people and locations is the basis of that value creation. And what happens with it in a material sense is taking place outside of that form of value creation. So this is one example. And we have to ask ourselves now, what does that mean to be the owner of means of production, that is capitalism criticism. But we can't say that anymore because anybody could have an idea like Uber and you do need a little bit of capital to implement it, but there is no lack in capital. Capital is abundant at the at the moment, and it's rather the problem than the solution. It's not like Becca. Becca used to say that capital used to be scarce. Now there is a surplus in, in capital. Surplus is maybe not the right word, but maybe there is a little too much capital, you can say. And how can we explain value creation to people? And then there are practical problems arising. Who in this value chain can make a contribution to the value creation? Every controller would then say, well, actually, things no longer work. They don't no longer fit because we don't even know where the value is created. This is a very simple example where you could say, yes, uh, we need to adapt. There are many other adaptations that are necessary. For example, the value of labor is being redefined. Labor has the lowest meaning for value creation. Labor used to be a, a guarantor for a continuity in the past. Is that still the case? Can we still have that in uh, our form of the economy today? Maybe the, it's not the only form of value creation, but an important form of value creation. This is why it is so challenging to describe the consequences for the labor market. I tried to look at literature and get an overview of it, and if you think uh, what is possible in prognosis, then uh, and thinking that we could lose 120% of the um, uh, jobs that we have because our economy works so great, well, then this is a hint to the fact that certain criteria are missing. Coming to prognosis, we have to come to a close soon. Our bar is going to be open in a few minutes, but one question in, in closing. I'm asking you uh, from a very European point point of view um, with regards to self-regulating systems, it may be tricky, but I want to highlight two European examples. I would like to ask you whether you think there is a, a paradox regarding the pattern, uh, two very recent phenomena that we have seen in Europe and Germany, or whether this is something dialectic. And I would like to ask you about the predictability of um, your patterns. There's two examples. You can pick whichever one you prefer. So the first example is the late but very intensive uh, increase of right-wing populism in Germany and in Europe as well. And the other example is the digital native development. Everybody's just looking at their phones all the time, the young generation, and one day they suddenly start the biggest social uh, movement since the 1960s, the Fridays for Future movement. These were powerful movements that were not detectable, that were not predictable. So what do you think about that? I don't think that the digital society is a society that is good with prognoses and predictions, especially not for major phenomena. If I were to pick one, I would like to maybe comment on both. The interesting question is this. 
it's not that deviation is unimaginable, but the question is this, what are we looking at at all? And so you may see that some forms of observation are very selective. Thinking of right-wing populism, you have to say, well, that's not a surprise. The populism solves a reference problem, and I'm sticking with my method here. So it solves a problem where you can say that apparently the political system seems to be very dependent on describing simple causalities, and you can do that in populism very simply. So many people have researched this question and they disagree with me, but I would say that one of the forms to understand right-wing populism is to say this, they try to bring as much order to the world as you can imagine. The interesting part about populism and the term is very difficult, right-wing populism, so let's assume, uh, let's look at the um, uh, electoral successes of the Alternative for Germany party. Um, they try to solve problems that are not on their election, in their election campaigns. So xenophobia is not the main motive to vote for this party, the AFD, but instead the motive is uh, trying to bash the elites, for example, because they usually don't deal with, let's and criticize climate change, for example. People think climate change is a topic for scientists, or the refugee crisis, uh, the attacks launched on cultural institutions like theaters, uh, opera houses, etc. Cornelia Kopecz would say that, yes, she would say something to that effect. And there's a lot of empirical research alluding to that. Fridays for Future is, in a way, also something that you can explain through digital technologies. This movement worked through these channels and thanks to them. But that is also a very selective form. Much of what Greta Thunberg is being allotted to is something that happened in the media and needed a representative in the media and had a certain sense of a representat representative function. And this may be a historical anomaly for this to take place, but if you take a closer look and compare, this form of protest is fairly different from the 1960s, from 1968. I would say this is um, has been unpredictable, seeing the new generation that addresses society and says, look around. You can't do what you're doing. Solve that problem. This is a highly interesting deviation that maybe has to do with the fact that the forms of communication are based on smaller sets than in the 1960s, where the sentences had to be half as long as a, as a sentence by Adorno. So our evening was fairly long as well, but I found it very interesting. Thank you very much. Thank you, Amin Nasse. Thank you for having joined us. The bar is open, and I'll see you back in November. Thank you, Armin Nasse.